Medical virtual assistants can be a game changer for private practices, but the idea of outsourcing work for some at least feels just not possible. Where would you start? How would you do it? And everything in between. Well, my guest today hopes to open your mind about this and maybe help you pull the trigger if you've been thinking about it for a while. I'm Carl White, principal at Market Advisory Group, which is a healthcare marketing agency, and I'm also the host of Practice Care. But the mission for both is the same, and that's to help private practice owners stay private. Not only is that what they want, but we just believe that care is better when it's you and your provider sitting at the table trying to figure out what's best for you. And nobody else is whispering in the provider's ear what their own agenda is. Whether it's a hospital, health system, owners in faraway lands, whoever they may be, eventually their agenda shows up and puts you, can put you in a difficult spot, and we want to help you avoid that. Today, my guest is Beth Lachance. Beth is the CEO of Reva Global Medical, that's R-E-V-A, a medical virtual assistant, virtual assistant company. Beth is leading Reva in vision and the day-to-day -day business operations, securing the functionality of the business to drive extensible, extensive and sustainable growth. Combining her strong leadership and determination with her 16 years of experience as a business owner specializing in real estate project management and investing with Hattrick Holding, and over 22 years of corporate experience in the private and public sector of surgical device, pharmaceutical, and specialty pharmacy, pharmacy industries. She keeps the company moving forward with high-level strategy while understanding the details of day-to-day -day execution to ensure continued success. And Beth, thank you for carving out some time to come on Practice Care. Yeah, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me, Carl. And I'm really excited to have this podcast with you. Yeah, me too. It's such a practical topic. It's such so important. Mm -hmm. a, a couple of years ago, I started with a virtual assistant, not a medical, but a virtual assistant myself. Yeah. Such a game changer. You you would, you if somebody were to tell me this is going to make a big difference, I, I of course would have wouldn't have doubted them, but I'm a true believer now that I'm doing it myself. And and so it's 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 just such such a good topic. I want to start with how did you, I mean, the career trajectory that you are on is described in your bio, one would not think of starting a company like this. So <laughs> fill that in for us. How, how, how did you arrive at this of yeah, all things? Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So interesting, interesting story. Um, my husband had started a virtual assistant company that specialized in real estate virtual assistance for real estate professionals. Okay. And he started the company about nine years ago. And um, I was in the private sector of uh, surgical device, the surgical device um, industry. And okay. um, he went through a, a really interesting and unexpected business partnership breakup with his partner. And so then I entered the picture. I immediately quit my job. I jumped in with him, started in with the virtual assistant world um, with his business um, that specialized in real estate VAs. Okay. Uh, but then because of my background in medical and because I paid attention heavily in the medical practices that I had been working in for so many years, I knew that there was, there was a, not only a space, but an absolute need for medical virtual assistants out there. And so, um, you know, I never dreamt of having my own business. I never wanted to be an entrepreneur in that way. Um, and my husband kind of, you know, pushed me out to do it. He was like, you got to do it. Just go for it. He's yeah. an entrepreneur at heart. Um, that's all he's ever known and ever done. And so I, I, he gave me the courage to do it. So, so with that, it, I had the platform to be able to go ahead and launch Reva Global Medical. And it has been such an amazing ride and an incredible need out there. So, yeah, so that's kind of how, you know, life, life sends you different types of forks in the road and you can choose which direction you head in. And I've just been really fortunate that this was the right time, the right business, um, and certainly, um, you know, and then of course, then the pandemic, which also like ha I have yeah. interesting stories behind that. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of what landed me into this space and it's been, an, it's been an absolutely incredible. Yeah. And when I first saw your name come through to become a guest on practice care, I just read about it and I've got a number of clients who are private practice owners. And I was just thinking about what you do with them. And I kept saying to myself, it just makes so much sense. It just, it just really does. I don't think anybody's thinking about it very much. Um, now, uh, one of my clients asked me one day, hey, you've got a VA, can I have her name or the name of the company? And I just, I paused because I thought, yeah, but they're not, they're not trained in medical. They're not trained right. in anything. There's gotta be some differences there. You know, Absolutely. doing work for me is lower, not lower key, but lower compliance, that's for sure. So yeah. let's get into it. How are medical virtual assistants trained? Let's just start right there. 
Yeah, great, great question. So I think where we need to start, um, even previous to that, is who do we recruit to come in to work at Reva Global Medical? Okay. You know, who are the candidates? Who who's here that's working? Um, and so we we heavily recruit people with medical background. So meaning they either have a bachelor's degree in nursing or they have a bachelor's degree something in the medical field, okay. um, and then beyond. They may have already been working at a, an insurance company. And so they already understand how our co-pays work, deductibles, co-insurance, all the above, right? They understand um, HIPAA, they understand different things that, that that happen in the medical world. And so that's obviously crucial to making sure that we're, we're, we're recruiting and putting the right people in place. So mm -hmm. that's the first part is that kind of who we're recruiting, who we're bringing in. Our training program is, is, is fantastic. Um, it gives us the opportunity, number one, day one, HIPAA certified. They have to be HIPAA certified in order to be able to work here and to be placed with a client. So that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's day one. And then we immediately dive into, we do extensive work and training on, on compliance, on HIPAA, on PHI, on um, how to handle patient um, you know, patient information, how to have comfort, you know, comfortable conversations directly with patients, whether it's doing a full new patient intake and how to get all the information needed and necessary um, in order to put it into the EMR of the client, um, all the way through to the back end of insurance verifications, prior authorizations, uh, and of course, billing. Um, billing, claims, denials, all the above, collections. So so our, our training is pretty extensive. It gives us an opportunity though, not everybody is good at everything. And some people have a very strong medical background and they're really strong in terms of their patient care, would be fantastic, but maybe not necessarily doing insurance verification. So we have the opportunity during training to really see what someone's skill set is and what are the best roles and the best tasks for them to do. And then that's how we assign them to particular roles. So that's how it starts. Okay. What yeah. I mean, you you listed a bunch of different types of work, but what's yeah. the what would you say is the characteristic? What makes good work for a VA as opposed to not, you know, not good work for a VA, for a medical right. VA? I, I think the, the best place to start is what are those quantifiable tasks in the practice that you would be able to, to offload to a virtual ass assistant? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what am I talking about? What, what does that mean? It, it could mean any number of things in different, in different departments. There's so many different departments and things that happen within medical practice. But if you look at what of your staff or what are you doing that are a typical 10 to $12 an hour task, mm -hmm. those are things that are great for a virtual assistant. Those are things that should be off of your mid-level practitioner or the doctor's plate. Those are mm -hmm. things that they absolutely should not be doing. Those things should be handed off to a medical virtual assistant. Um, even some of your really high level medical assistants in your practice, they should be focusing on patient care. They should be focusing on some of the other things and helping the, the, the physician um, with everything that they need to get done, right? The administrative piece of what needs to get done behind the scenes of handling patients those are fantastic tasks and great things to be able to offload and hand off to a medical, a medical virtual professional. Okay. I'm thinking of like the, the, the characteristic I'm thinking of as, as I listen to you is like repeatable stuff, stuff that happens over and over and over again. They can absolutely. get good at it. Not like, you know, if that's the case, then that, and you're saying absolutely like, why, why is that? Well, I think number one, those are also the tasks that are, that are, that are easily, um, that are easily delegated to someone outside of the practice, right? Mm -hmm. So um, they're quantifiable, they're manageable, and they're also things that, that can immediately make an impact on the practice. Mm -hmm. And so it's difficult when you're onboarding a new employee and you bring someone in and you don't really know what they're going to be doing mm -hmm. and you don't really know how you're going to delegate those. Like you have to think about a virtual assistant in the same way. You, you, you really need to know, okay, well, how is the delegation of tasks going to be done? How can we quantify it? How can we make sure that they're efficient and they're getting, getting it done in the way it needs to get done? Um, so it's no different than hiring somebody directly into your practice as an employee. You need to know exactly what are they going to be doing it? How are they going to be getting it done? So, that, so that's kind of how that, how that goes. Um, one other really important aspect of this is where you can start is you can start by just simply looking at where which departments are overloaded right now in in your medical practice you know if mm. if you have patients that are calling in to your front desk and cannot get through and you've got a full invoice a full you know inbox um a voicemail inbox that's full by you know by lunchtime mm -hmm. then clearly you need additional staffing at your front desk but that can be done with a medical virtual assistant 
you can have a virtual receptionist from Reva Medical that would be able to help with handling patient phone calls that are coming in, um, scheduling patients, rescheduling patients, cancellation, canceled appointments, so on and so forth. So that's that's one of the very first things that you can look at, just it, even just with that department, front desk, right? Mm -hmm. We are, you know, what's being overloaded and how can we be of assistance there? Then there's so many other things, like many practices still have hundreds of faxes that are coming in every day. Where are those faxes? Like who's handling that? If you have mm -hmm. a mid-level practitioner or the doctor is handling that or even a medical assistant, um, those are things that are very simply delegated to a VA that the VA can you know, see those as they're coming through, pinpoint anything that needs to be addressed and that needs to be sent, sent either to the physician for physician oversight um, and then tagged and put directly into the EMR under the patient's name or where it needs to be. Mm -hmm. So there's so many different ways a medical professional, a virtual medical professional can be of assistance to a practice. It really just depends on what are the pain points in your practice? Where are you struggling? Where do you think you really need additional help? Um, and we help with that. Once you kind of know what those things are, we, number one, find a really great professional that would fit, be a great fit for the role. But then we also help create what that process flow and, and, and that workflow looks like. Um, why reinvent the wheel, right? We know what yeah. works out there in different medical practices. And if you're not exactly sure how you want to delegate the work, we can help kind of create that. If you already know how you want things to go, we do it your way. You tell us how you want it done and we get it done your way. So in the, in the hierarchy of objections, <laughs> yeah. I, I wonder if one of them is, how do I know what they're doing? They're not here. They're not on site. That's like a, you know, that's like, it's a, it's a barrier for some. So I'm curious, like what, what you say to that and what some other objections are that you hear. I know in listeners, it sounds like a sales pitch for Reva. It's not meant to, uh, but the right. concept of, especially, I mean, in normal uh, job market times, this is a good idea. Now it's like times a hundred, a good idea, at least to think about, but let's get it all out. Like what's on, you know, I, I got to yeah. believe one of them is they're not on site. How do I know what they're doing? How do I know that they're, they're not running away with data and doing bad things? So what do <laughs> yeah. you, you know, and all sorts of horror stories. What, so, you know, what, what do you say to that? And what are some other objections that you hear? Yeah, I think that's always been the number one deterrent mm -hmm. for medical practices to hire a medical virtual professional. Um, and I keep utilizing that term, by the way, medical virtual professional, I because that, yeah. I think the terminology of virtual assistant sometimes has a negative connotation. We automatically assume well, a virtual assistant can handle a less workload, or maybe they handle like not difficult tasks, right? Mm -hmm. Simple, simple tasks. That's not the case here. We're talking about people that have a, a, a bachelor's degree. They've got a four-year college education. They're smart. They take initiative. Um, and they've gone through our training program so that we know that they can handle the workload. Mm -hmm. So having that said, they're not just a virtual assistant, they're virtual professionals. So I keep using, utilizing that term and I would just Understood. wanna make sure that I'm clear on the reason, on the reason yeah. behind that. But the objections, gosh, well, so there's pre-COVID objections and now there's <laughs> post-COVID objections. Right. So pre-COVID was, how do I, just like you said, how do I really know what's getting done? Like they're not here in the medical practice. And with medicine, virtual assistants, it's new. It's so new because a lot of medical professionals did not believe that you could have good patient care or do any kind of patient care virtually. Mm -hmm. With COVID and the pandemic, it changed everyone's mindset shifted because we had to go virtual. Mm -hmm. We had to go to telehealth. We had to send uh, send our, our in staff, um, our in office staff home and they were doing and being able to. And what we learned is that not only is it possible, but it works in an excellent way, we're mm -hmm. able to really truly manage a practice and be able to do a lot virtually now. So having that said, pre-COVID, my, my strategy sessions and my sales calls with physicians or medical practices, uh, practice managers was very different than what it is now. It okay. used to be, well, you know, how can this, like, why would I do this and how can I do it? And then I would have to go through those objections and, you know, how do we know what they're really getting done? So let me start with that objection. So yeah. how do we know what, what they're really getting done? Um, first and foremost, there's productivity reports that are sent on a daily basis. So the start of day, there's a start of day report that is sent from the, the virtual professional that says, this is what, the, what you know my tasks are for day, today. This is what I'm setting out to get accomplished. Mm -hmm. at the end of day, you get an end of day report of exactly what was accomplished. So how many patients were touched? What medical records were updated? 
how many phone calls were taken in and how many new patient intakes were, you know, wow. were completed. Those sort of things. So full, that's more than you get with your own staff, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> and that rapport, we actually help create that with our clients. We know what, what typically what we want to see on our end because that's sent to us, our management team. And I'll dive into a little bit of that in a moment. But mm -hmm. ultimately, you know, there might be data in that end of day report that the, you know, that the medical practice doesn't want to see. Mm -hmm. There might be data that's not there that they would like to see. So we create that report with them on whether some of the data and the analytics that they think is important that they would want to see. Okay. So that's like that productivity report. So you know what is getting done. You know how many patient phone calls have been coming in and how many have been answered, so on and so forth. Okay. So that's, that's, you know, that number one objection, right? The other objection, and probably one of the, one of the biggest objections is, well, you know, how is this person managed? Like, is this, you know, how, how do we know that they're really there besides the productivity reports? How are they being managed? We have a client service manager um, that is assigned to each, each practice. And that client service manager was responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of overseeing the virtual assistant or virtual assistants that are going to be working with that practice. Mm -hmm. So it is on us to make sure, is the VA checking in on time? Are they, are they back from lunch break on time? Mm -hmm. Are they hitting the productivities and the KPIs that you have set and we have set out for that VA? Are they hitting them? And if they're not hitting them, it's on us to find out, is it a will issue? Is it a skill issue? And then it's on us to fix that, to make sure that we get that up and running and, and, and make it workable. Okay. So that is the management side of what our services provide is a huge piece of our success with our clients because we're not just handling a, handling, handing a virtual assistant over to a medical practice and saying, here, we've got somebody great, good luck. That doesn't necessarily work. <laughs> Hope it goes well. <laughs> yeah, that, that we have found with, with our, some of our competitors, that's still their model. That doesn't necessarily work. Our success and what has been an, an, an incredible thing for our clients is we have taken off the management piece from our clients, from our medical practices, we are handling that. So if there's an HR issue, if there's consistent tardiness, we are writing up the VA, we are handling the HR hearings, we are taking care of all of that, right? Mm -hmm. So if we have a VA that's being, you know, overworked, I mean, we have medical practices that are incredibly busy. And there are certain times of the year that insurance verifications, there's a lot more or verifying benefits, there's tons more. And that's mm -hmm. just physically possible for one VA or even two VAs to get it done. And so it's our staff, it's our management team that's responsible for bringing that information back to the, back to the practice to say, hey, this is way too much for a VA to be able to get done in a nine hour shift or in a 40 hour work week. So you really need to add on a VA. We can bring on a new VA, an additional VA for you and get them trained and get them up and running. Okay. Or what if there's not enough for the VA to do, right? So that's yeah. also on us to kind of come back to the back to the medical practice and say, we've noticed that there's been a drop in volume. Are there any other tasks that the VA can do? How can we how can we help you? Let's uh, let's try to get, you know delegate some more to the VA to get them um, really really productive and um, and fill fulfill their day. So that's the management side, okay. um, and what and what you know, kind of what we do to to make sure that things not only go well but continue to go well. And to kind of help us on some of those or those objections that come along with, you know, how to hire or why to even hire a medical virtual assistant and how to make it work in your practice. Yeah, I mean, as you're saying this, I'm comparing it to work X, body of work X has to get done. We can either do it ourselves or we can go to a, a medical VA company. And in either case, there's a certain amount of, of way that we need it done. And there's a certain amount of oversight that we need to make sure it's getting done and that things are going. We can either do it ourselves uh, or we can try to find somebody else to do it. But the option that's not available is we can't just let it slide. So right. you've got a choice. You know, you're, you're welcome practice X to try to find people to, to hire on. And, and you can totally do that. Another option though, uh, is to outsource, just like you outsource a lot of stuff. Like, you know, if right. you outsource your billing, I guess the only way you really know if it's getting done is if money's coming in. <laughs> Correct. So yeah. if money's coming in with the outsourced VA company, well then, I mean, unless they're totally screwing up, but it must, it must be working pretty well. Um, right. Or it's I, going the I, way you want it, right? It's, it's when you compare the two scenarios, you got to make a choice. You can't, Correct. you know, do nothing is not an option. Um, so which one you want to pick? Right. And I, I think one of the biggest things that I, that I tend to say to on every single strategy session that I do with a potential new client, I explain to them that you're not outsourcing. That's, that's not really what you're doing. You are, you are insourcing. You are bringing in a medical virtual assistant that's part of your practice. We are a true extension of your practice. 
yes, we are managing the day-to-day -day of the VA. That's a, a service that we are providing and we're providing great people to be able to fulfill the need. However, we aren't expecting for you to come into our tools and find the work that the VA did. Mm -hmm. We are an extension of the practice. We are coming into your practice and working directly within your team and with your team. And so our medical vir virtual assistants, um, you're not working with different, you know, it's not like a call center. It's not like, oh, you know, we need additional help at our front desk. We're not a call center for you. That That's not how this works. We are a true, a true extension of your practice. So if, you know, Jane is your new medical virtual assistant, Jane is only with your practice and works only with you and your team. She is not assigned to any other medical practices. She's not part of a bigger mm -hmm. call center. It's, it's not like that. It is truly an extension of your medical team. Okay. What types of work is not good work? to, you know, give to a medical VA? What, what, what kind of work, you know, aside from patient care, let's say, um, yeah. <laughs> what, what, what should not go, would you say? Yeah. Because uh, if everything, if something sounds good for everything, it gets a little, really, are you sure? So is there- Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. So let me tell you where I, where uh, some of the horror stories come in. Okay. When we have a medical practice that comes to us and they want us to somehow manage some of their team. They want the medical virtual assistant to oversee their front desk team. They uh, want them to be more of like a, an intermediate manager, if you will. We have, you know, medical professionals that are relocating, keeping their practices open in one state, but relocating to a different state and they're hiring and they want to hire a medical virtual assistant to kind of be their eyes and ears in the practice and kind of work as like a virtual office manager assistant sort of thing. Huh. That, that I never would have thought of that. And That's, you have, okay. I have so many requests for things like that. Wow. And we have trialed it. It does not, it, it, that is not where we fit well. Those are not tasks that should be delegated to a medical virtual professional. Okay. Um. So, so there's lots of things in a medical practice that are, that are fantastic to assign to a VA. Something like that is not, you want, you know, we're not going to be the eyes and the ears of, of your, of your practice and your team. Mm -hmm. We're not there to tattle if somebody is, you know, not getting their workload done. That's part of your internal team. Mm -hmm. um, and we're certainly not going to be at the highest level in terms of management um, or to take over as like an office manager or to be a direct office manager assistant. Those are not, not a great way to utilize a medical virtual professional. Right. It's not a great way. Right. Yeah. Now, who would you say the, the medical a virtual professional that should kind of report to, uh, you know, who, yeah. who should be the touch point? Is it, yeah. is it the practice manager or the owner? Or is it, you know, whoever's yeah. got the time kind of thing? What, what does that look like? Great question. It really depends on which department they're going to be working in. So if it's a smaller medical practice, typically it's the practice manager. Um, very mm -hmm. rarely is it the visit, is it the physician, unless the physician doesn't really have an active practice manager and it's a really small practice and it's themselves and maybe a medical assistant. Okay. Um, but for the most part, it's typically, um, you know, but again, depending on the, on the department, it's typically the practice manager. In some cases, if it's a slight, if it's a larger practice and let's say we've got a team of virtual assistants that are working in the, in the insurance or the benefit side of things, then it's typically a manager that's working within that department, that then is our POC, that, you know, that point of contact. Mm -hmm. So our client service manager is responsible for figuring that out. Like who is the point of contact? Who is the one that they're going to be meeting with consistently in the practice? Mm -hmm. um, because ultimately it's their responsibility to make sure that we have an ongoing great relationship with them, but it's, it's the relationship that happens between the client service manager and, uh, and the, either the practice manager or whoever that POC is to find out how are things going? They have mm -hmm. to meet with them at least twice a month, at least twice a month to see how are things going? Let's go over the data, in, data analytics. The client service manager puts together a monthly productivity report that's also sent to them. Okay. Um, and so that's a great uh, opportunity for them to be able um, to kind of do a deep dive and to see how are things going? You know, how is Jane doing? How's Mariah doing? How's, um, you know, Anna doing? How are each of these VAs doing in the practice? Are they hitting the KPIs? Are there any needs for improvement anywhere? And those are some of those conversations that happen. And then it kind of, and then it goes from there. So that's, we kind of figure that a lot of times the medical practice will know who the POC will be. Okay. Sometimes we have to find, sometimes we have to find who that POC, it might be a better fit because sometimes the practice manager, if it's a larger practice, the practice manager is just too busy to have and really doesn't necessarily may not really know within a smaller department what 
the, the analytics that are necessary and may not really know how's it going with the VAs. They're, yeah. look, they're looking at the overall full practice as, as you know, um, as a whole, not the individual uh, individual tasks that are happening within each department. And so we'll kind of figure out who who is the person within that department that we need to be working closely with to get the feedback necessary to make sure it's successful. Got it. Okay, yeah. good. Man, this is a really good introduction to this topic. Um, yeah. Something I say to a lot of guests is we could probably double or triple the time and get into a bunch of different avenues about um, you know good profiles, bad profiles of, of whatever it might be. But in the interest yeah. of keeping practice care more on the bite-sized advice side of, of podcast, <laughs> <laughs> a couple yeah. of uh, a couple of wrap-up questions, which sometimes are quick, sometimes are not. So we'll see. Sure. Um, first one is just in the context of what what we've been talking about. Is there anything I should have asked you but just did not? say probably about maybe the onboarding. Okay. How would you actually do the onboarding of a VA? Okay. Um, and this is a this is really important because this dictates how what the success will be quickly, right? Mm-hmm. Will it be a VA will be fully up and functioning within four weeks? Or are we if the onboarding isn't done correctly, it could be three months. Mm-hmm. So um, so that's an important piece in terms of how are you going to onboard someone new? And so my always my recommendation is you know, before selecting that anticipated start date, right? We, we kind of, what we do is we create, once a, a new client, you know, starts with us, uh, signs up with us, we immediately, we create what we anticipate to be the start date of the VA. So during that interim period, before that start date, um, we kind of give our client like a list of stuff that needs to get done, right? So like the tools, what are mm-hmm. the tools that are being utilized in the practice? Um, making sure that the VA has access to all those tools. So getting in the login, the login credentials that are all necessary in order to, to be able to immediately access those tools. Who's going to be training the VA? Obviously, the VA has trained from us in terms of like some of their backgrounds so that we can make sure that they're um, they're really ready to do the task. Yeah. But they need to learn what's your process flow? How does your practice run? You know, what's the culture within your practice? How do you want the culture and it to feel? Are you a white glove practice or are you just seeing as many patients as possible and you're just another number running through as many patients as possible? So the VA has to be, has to really be entrenched into the practice and be trained on the tools, on the workflow and the process documents need to be created. Um, and, and also who's going to be responsible for doing that training to get the VA up and running. Yeah. So that's probably one of the key components to things going really well in the beginning. Um, and we have a lot of practices that they have their ducks in a row. They already have, you know, they've, they've already got a, a you know, a, a booklet that they can scan and send over to the VA as like, Oh, you're like a new employee. And I was just, just thinking like, that treat it like you're any other time hire. And, you know, maybe you find it simpler. But, exactly. But treat really it should. as though you're hiring a new employee and how would you, how would you bring that new employee through you know, through the training within your practice. Mm-hmm. So that would probably be the only the only thing I think that we didn't cover that I think is a, a really important piece of the puzzle. And many practices kind of need to figure that out before before signing up. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So yep. that's the first question. That was that was good. Uh, the other yeah. question is: so let's imagine we've hopefully we've caught the attention of some listeners and, and they're saying saying yeah. to themselves, yeah, you know what, I really need to look at this. Um, what are one or two tangible steps you you advise them to take? as soon as they're done listening to us talk to get going on it? Yeah. Um, great question. So, um, and I get, I get this question a lot. Um, so the very, very first thing you need to do is really take stock in the staff you already have and what are the tasks that they are already doing? Um, which of your team members are really overloaded Mm. and, we all know like reimbursement doesn't look the same as it used to. So we're having to see more patients in order to be able to get the same reimbursement that we used to get in the past. Right. So more patients to get the same amount of money we used to make. So what does that mean? Well, as a physician, we're all really hard workers. So yeah, we'll, we'll crunch away and all right, I need to see 50 patients a day instead of 40. I'll do it. But not realizing that the whole rest of your staff also then is seeing 50 yeah, patients that's true. It's and all of the administrative more. tasks that go with that. So as a physician, you can be a workhorse and you can, you know, that's, that's how you're driven and that's how you can do your day, but realize that all of the other things that work around those patients, the administrative piece, all of that is also being tasked to the, the team that you already have in place. Yeah. So my number one suggestion would be look at your team. Who's overwhelmed? What potentially can be, can be taken off of their plate? Yeah. Um, it's competitive out there. You do not want to lose your good people. And with, you know, another practice down the street, you know, 
offering more money or a $5,000 or a $10,000 sign on bonus, you have potential of losing your good staff. Mm -hmm. So my suggestion would be really take stock in who's on your team now, who is absolutely very valuable and you do want, do not want to lose them and have meetings with them. Find out what tasks are you doing that you don't like? And let's see if we can get some of those things off of their plate. Maybe you have somebody who's really high level, but they're doing 10 and 10 and $12 an hour tasks. Mm -hmm. Why would you do that? You're, you're paying somebody really well, but they're doing tasks that frankly can be easily delegated to someone else. Yeah. Um, and maybe their day and their job would be more fulfilling if they were doing other tasks and not doing those 10 to $12 an hour tasks that you could offload. Yeah. So that would be my first suggestion is kind of do that deep dive into your team and then really see, okay, well, what are the pain points in my practice and where can I add medical virtual assistance to really make it so that my team will never want to leave, yeah. right? That they have the support and the additional team around them. And it doesn't break, it doesn't break the bank. It doesn't kill the budget. Add yeah. a medical virtual assistant to your different departments. So it is a fraction of the cost that would it be to add another employee to your team, you know, within your practice. So and let, let me just add, you know, what are some examples of what you consider to be 10 to $12 tasks? I, I think of my own work and I can't say I'm the best at valuing tasks. I When, when I sure. outstart outsource work, I thought, you know, what is, you know, uh, lower than my hourly rate tasks that are purely repetitive and that, you know, a person who's sure. reasonably intelligent off the street could do it if given proper training and instruction and support. So, but in, in, in a, in, in a private practice, what are some, in your opinion, some examples of 10, 10 to $12 tasks? Yeah. Uh, first and foremost, referrals, whether you have to send them out because you're in primary care practice or if you need to track them down, that's something a medical virtual assistant should be able to do, sending out referrals or collecting referrals. Collection of medical records. If you're a specialty practice, obviously you need medical records from other practices that the mm -hmm. patient has already been to or from um, you know, you know, different diagnostic testing that they've already been through and you need to track those down. That's something that absolutely should be delegated to a, a medical virtual assistant and not to your in your in-house staff. Um, scheduling patient appointments, um, you know, or handling uh, handling triaging calls coming in. If you have excessive phone calls coming in from our pa from your patients, that can be handled from a medical virtual assistant to make sure they're triaged appropriately and that they're not always just going through a phone tree and then en ending up in someone's voicemail, right? So more mm -hmm. of like that white glove service and being able to handle that. Fax review, faxes coming in, getting that out. Um, insurance verifications, insurance verifications, it is taking a tremendous amount of time of your medical professionals in your practice of sitting on the phone on hold. Oh my God. I One client, we do phone call tracking and I listen to some of these calls. It's a good seven or eight minutes just to get the person I have a card. I need, and I'm, I'm listening to these going, oh my God, the time. Things yes, you would never and, think of. A lot of that, the easy part is calling up the insurance company, finding out the benefits because you know what you're talking about. The hard part yeah. is, wait, what's the number I need to give you? Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> <Yeah>. Painfully stunning <laughs> or stunningly painfully painful, stunning. I'm not sure. <laughs> and and frankly, even just the hold times, once you call the insurance companies to, to verify those CPT codes, um, you know, ultimately you could be, on hold for such a long time. Uh -huh. And then once you get on with an agent and that agent has no idea what you're asking for, and then you're rerouted to whether it's a supervisor or you're rerouted to a different department, it just, it is painstakingly a yes. task that absolutely can be, can be delegated and getting off, gotten off the plate of your medical professionals or in your practice. Excellent. So, so those are those 10, even full new patient intakes, new patient intakes for specialties are time consuming. It's imperative that we get all the medical information from the patients, but who's doing that? Is that your front desk staff? So you're, you know, you your front desk staff may be on the phone with a new patient that's going to be coming in, and they've got to collect all that information. Um, or if you're one of the, you know, practices that, that don't do it that way, you send them a packet or you send them a link to be able to the patient to fill all that information. Well, who's going back into the EMR to make sure that everything is there, mm -hmm. right? And so it's a waste of the time of, the, of your practice, you know, within your practice, but also the physician. If you've got a new patient coming in for a new patient consult mm -hmm. and all the information isn't in the, in the EMR for the physician ahead of time, you know, usually that's not a good thing, yeah, right? God. So, yes. and that could be all delegated to a, a, a virtual assistant from Reva Global Medical that would be able to go ahead and go in to make sure is everything there that needs to be there for that new patient consult for that specialty, for that physician? You know, are all the medical records there? Are the diagnostic 
results all in there um, so that that patient is getting the information and the time and the physician has all the information that he or she right. needs to have that consult. So, um, so those are those 10 to $12 an hour tasks that are very easily delegated and are fantastic work for a medical virtual assistant. Got it. All right. Thank you for clarifying that. And yeah. again, um, Beth, thanks for, for coming on practice care. I really appreciate it. You've, you've delivered what I hope just really good practical advice Big payoff. I don't know how many people are thinking about it, but hopefully more are now. Yeah. Um, once again, Beth Lachance with Riva Global Medical. Uh, we'll put all of your contact information that you gave us into the show notes so that anybody yeah. for your episode who wants to contact you can do so. A yep. couple of points before wrapping up. First, uh, if you're someone like Beth or I, you serve private practices and you've got some experience that you think others private practice owners in particular would benefit of from, please, we want you to come on practice care so that you can share it with them and they can start benefiting from it. In the show notes for Beth's episode and all episodes are some instructions. It's just a quick form. Tell us what's on your mind so that we can get you scheduled as soon as possible. And finally, if you haven't done so, please subscribe to Practice Care on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thanks very much. And until next time.